Hello, today we're going to talk about diffraction. So we have two goals today. So just like we did last time, we're going to answer a question like, how the heck do you make any sense out of this crazy pattern? So we're going to understand patterns look like this. And what this shows, is what it's trying to show, is a uh, kind of a plane wave, a sine wave basically, coming in from the left. And then it encounters a barrier, and the barrier has a uh, relatively small hole in the middle of it. And so a lot of the wave gets cut off by the barrier. But some of the wave passes through the hole. But it doesn't just pass through in a straight line. You kind of get this spreading out of the wave, and you also see a little bit of constructive and destructive interference going on. So that's the uh, diffraction pattern we get here. And in addition to that, we'll try and uh, talk some more about the history of our understanding of light. Okay, so how do we define diffraction? And again, diffraction is what you see in this pattern here. And so diffraction is a spreading out of a wave when it encounters a, an object or an opening. Okay, so for instance, let's say you're walking down a hallway and you can hear the conversation of a couple of people who are in an office even though you can't see those people so what happens is the sound waves will refract out of that office so just, sorry, diffract as they come out of that office or office door and spread out and so you'll be able to hear them as you walk down the hallway well how come you can't see them because light's a wave as well right so uh, well the issue there is that the doorway has a size which is about the same size as the wavelength of the sound waves and so you get quite a bit of diffraction happening when that's true but of course the light waves are hundreds of nanometers in wavelength it's much much smaller than the uh, the doorway so they pretty much go through in uh, in straight lines no appreciable diffraction when the wavelength is tiny compared to the size of the opening or the object that the wave is encountering Okay, so we'll go back to our, what I call the double source equation. So for two sources a distance d apart, you get constructive interference occurring at particular angles when d sine theta is m lambda. This is consistent with our equation we did last time where we said delta L, the path length difference, is m lambda. Okay, so you have two sources in the lower left and you're standing at some place far away to the upper right where that little pink dot is. If you zoom in on the um, where the sources are, okay, so you basically get parallel lines that go off. They're essentially parallel that go off to the source. They're not 100% parallel, but pretty close. And so, what's our path length difference? Well, we've got a nice right angle triangle there, where we have theta is the angle between kind of a vertical line and where the observer is. Well, that same angle is in that triangle. And so the path length difference, how much further you are from one source than the other, turns out to be d sine theta. So the path length difference in this case is d sine theta. And so you make that an integer number of wavelengths and you get, you expect to get constructive interference. That's for two sources. So the two sources here are shown in red. Of course, there's no waves being emitted in between the sources. Okay, so then we get to what's called the single slit equation. So now we just have a single opening. So we fill all that space between the two sources we originally had with more sources. And those are sending out waves in phase. They're all in phase with each other, sending out these waves. Well, it turns out now we have an equation that says A sine theta is M lambda. Well, what's A? Well, A is the thing we just called D. D was the distance between the two uh, sources in our double source equation. And we just filled that space in with openings. And now, so now we have a whole thing that's uh, a wide. Now a and d are exactly the same number. Okay. And now a sine theta is m lambda gives destructive interference for the single slit, whereas it just gave us constructive interference for the double slit. So you don't you take away all those intermediate um, sources. The, and they're in blue and orange and uh, green, and plus one red one right in the middle. Take all those away, just leave the two at the end. You go back to d sine theta is m lambda, and it's constructive interference. So why does this happen? 
Well, that picture is supposed to help us try and understand why. Okay. So what's happening here is that um, if you look at the two sources on either end, so they were just constructively interfering. So A sine theta is a wavelength here. So if the source on the left is one wavelength further from the observer than the source on the right is, What's the path length difference between the source on the right and the source in the exact center, which is also shown in red? Well, that's halfway across the opening. If all the way across the opening results in a path length difference of lambda, full wavelength, then going halfway across the opening results in a path length difference of only half a wavelength. And so the rightmost source and the one in the middle will destructively interfere with each other because they're half a wavelength off in path length. Similarly, just shift over a little bit left. The two green ones, half a wavelength, path difference, they destructively interfere. The two orange ones, half a wavelength off, destructively interfere. Blue ones, destructively interfere. What happens basically is the whole, the, all the waves from the right half of the opening, opening destructively interfere with the, all the waves from the left half of the opening. You get nothing. Okay, so this is why the equation that gave us constructive interference and a very similar looking uh, that was for the double source, and a very similar looking equation for the single slit, single opening of width A is now destructive interference. Okay, so we'll kind of look at these, uh, the intensity of the waves coming through the opening, kind of as a, in some sense as a function of angle or as a function of uh, where we pick these up on a, on a screen maybe for shining a laser beam. So if you shine a laser beam through a narrow opening in a card or something like that, then you get the top pattern. Okay, most of the light goes straight through, but some is diffracted. Okay, actually the intensity falls off to zero at a particular spot, but then you get a little bit coming back. You can see a little bit of intensity way off to the left and the right. Double source, what you expect to get is that you basically get uh, constructive interference, then destructive interference, constructive, and the, all those constructive peaks are basically the same height. Well, what if you shine a single laser at two slits that are very close together? That's called the double slit. Well, what you get is basically a combination of the single slit pattern and the double source pattern. You get this uh, intensity pattern that's shown at the bottom. Okay, so you get these uh, intense dark and bright lines in the middle and then you get a little bit of stuff toward the edges okay but basically if lights sent out uniformly in all directions then you expect to see what you what's shown in the double source picture that all the peaks are equally bright but it turns out that each slit does not send out light uniformly in all directions each slit instead sends out a diffraction pattern most of the light is sent in out in the forward director, direction. And so you get interference between two single slit patterns when you have the double slit, and that results in the pattern at the bottom. But it's basically like multiplying the single slit pattern by the double source pattern, and you get the double slit pattern. Okay. And again, interference between the two diffraction patterns, one from each slit produces a double slit pattern. Okay, and the double slit pattern actually shows what are called missing orders. So these are places where you expect peaks in the pattern to occur according to the double source equation, d sine theta equals m lambda. But it turns out that neither one of the openings is sending out light in, any, in that direction anyway because it corresponds to a zero in the single slit pattern. Okay, so you don't see any light there where you might expect some based on the double source equation. Okay, so these are known as missing orders. So if you did this with a red laser beam shining through two uh, narrow openings closely spaced, then you'd actually kind of get this pattern of light on the screen that looks like these dots down below. So what you want to do here is identify the center of the pattern, and that's m equals zero. And then as you go to the right, you say, well, there's a m equals 1 dot that uh, there should be a bright spot there as predicted by d sine theta of m lambda. 
and then m equals 2, you get another one, and m equals 3, well it's not as bright, m equals 4, you expect one according to d sine theta equals m lambda uh, equation, but you can see there's a missing order there, you don't, you expect to get a bright dot, but you don't see one, and that's because right there at that angle, there is a zero in the a sine theta equals m lambda pattern, so the diffraction pattern goes to zero at that particular place. And then you get a little bit of light coming back. And then if you're missing m equals 4, you'd also be missing m equals 8 and m equals 12, etc. all the multiples of 4. And we've just looked at the pattern going from the center out to the right, and there's a mirror image going off to the left. Okay, and you'll get to explore that in a lab, and we'll do some more things on this in class. Okay, but for now, let's go back and review a little bit of history. Because it's kind of interesting how all this worked. So, before 1800, so we're going back over 200 years, we had two competing models of light. So, according to Sir Isaac Newton, light acts as if it was made up of particles. This is known as the corpuscular theory, or the corpuscular model. However, the Dutch scientist, Christian Huygens, said light acts as a wave. Okay, these guys were contemporaries of one another. Huygens was a little bit older. But Newton, you know, everybody's heard of Newton. Newton did some great stuff in theories of gravity and uh, laws of motion and things like that. So if Newton said light acts like particles, he must be right. So the particle model dominated for a long time. But then, 1801, along comes Thomas Young with his double slit experiment. And one thing you should be astonished by this experiment done in 1801. These days, when we do it in the lab, we have a nice laser beam, it's a monochromatic light source. So Young's light source is basically the sun. Okay, so it's all you know, red and green and blue and violet and yellow and orange all mixed together. Okay, and that makes it a lot harder to sort out than when you use, say, a red laser beam or a green laser beam when you got a single wavelength. But here is uh, Young's own picture about uh, his explanation. And, you know, this is light acting as waves right here. So, uh, so there's a lot of evidence based on that experiment. The light was acting like a wave. And in particular, a uh, few French scientists uh, really took this and ran with it. And so Augustin Fresnel was... Uh, in Paris, presenting his work on diffraction to the, to the Académie Française, the French Academy of Science, in 1818. And Poisson was there, Simeon Poisson, and he didn't buy any of this wave model at all. And what he realized was, if the wave theory was right, that there should be a bright spot at the center of the shadow of a round object. Now, why would you expect that? Well, if you illuminate a round object, you get a round shadow and behind it, but then right around the edge, if you look at the ring of light at the very edge of that ball, okay, then if you go straight back to a wall behind the, uh, the ball, then right in the center of that shadow, you're the same distance away from that ring of light around the edge of the ball, okay? So same path length for all those rays of light, you would expect constructive interference to happen and that should give you a nice bright spot at the center of a shadow, which, of course, nobody had ever seen. So Poisson said, you know, this, this uh, wave model is just a bunch of hooey, okay? Just a bunch of nonsense, okay? And then Arego went off, D Dominic Arego, and he went off and carefully did the experiment, and he showed, in fact, there is a point, a nice bright spot at the center of a shadow if you do the experiment very carefully. And so Poisson came up with this in hopes of shooting down the wave model, and instead it turned out that it provided uh, evidence to support the wave model instead. Okay. It's probably hard to see this uh, tiny picture at the bottom right. You might be able to see it, I'm not sure. So I'm going to blow it up a little bit here in hopes you can see it better. And this is a picture that I took myself. So I've got a, uh, a nail. You can see the point of the nail at the very top of the picture. And I put a little magnet on top of the, the nail, and so the, uh, there's a steel ball bearing that's kind of magnetically 
attached to the uh, the nail here hanging in midair. And then I illuminated the thing with a green laser and looked at the shadow on the wall behind the uh, the ball. And I took a picture of that shadow and I magnified it here. And I hope that you can now see this nice nice bright spot at the center of the shadow coming from constructive interference between all those rays of light that are kind of in a ring around the edge of the ball and the same distance away from the center of that shadow, so constructively interfering when they hit the wall. Okay, so uh, there's really nice evidence that light acts like a wave and uh, light does diffract around objects when it encounters them. Okay, so that's all for today about uh, with our introduction to diffraction.